Two Pro Tour wins versus seven Pro Tour wins. Two immense giants of the game. I wouldn't go anywhere if I was you. This is the matchup that we have all been waiting for. It's going to be some great magic. And Day9 and Cedric are going to preview it for us. Thank you so much, Maria. Yes, Shota Yasuoka versus Kai Buda. Woo! And this is a spicy one, too. We got a pair of Bolas' Citadels in Yasuoka's deck. What do you think about this matchup? Well, you, 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 you took away my thunder a little bit there. This is the card, actually, that <laughs> is kind of one of my cards of the tournament, truth be told. Yeah. Uh, Shota has two copies of Bolas of Citadel and a unique build of Esper Control that I am very, very excited to watch. If the idea here was to come into a tournament with a deck that beats Esper Control in the Mirror and other Esper decks, then he has the best card to go about doing that. Bolas of Citadel is absolutely nuts. He's still got Planeswalkers and other effects that are pretty good, like Thought Eraser and other things that we have seen over the course of this weekend. But two copies copies of Command the Dreadfort, two copies of Bolsa Citadel, those are your mere breakers, and as long as he can stay alive long enough to cast either one of those cards, I expect him to win this match. There's another subtle oddness to Shota Yasuoka's decks, which is a pair of cast downs and no real Tyrant Scorns anywhere. I mean, sure, there's the triple copies of Oath of Kai, but a lot of the early removal we've been seeing from other players is instead replaced with two Discovery Dispersals and uh, two Revitalizes. Correct. This combos very well with the Command the Dread Horde and the Bulls of the Bulls and Citadels. His, his numbers are a little bit different, uh, which I kind of like, and I think it's pretty interesting. You know, those those kind of measures to kind of stay alive during the early game and for some more yeah. manipulation is pretty nice since they all essentially do draw a card. Now, if we look at Kai Buddha's deck, it's it's the traditional Esper Hero deck. It's the same list that we saw out of Brad Nelson, mm -hmm. out of BBD. The whole goal is to plant a Hero Precinct 1 early and use that to slowly build the board protected by a variety of flexible removal spells. The D-Sparks, very significant. Were there no D-Sparks in Yasuoka's list? It doesn't appear to be the case, at least in the main deck. Maybe perhaps in the sideboard. D-Spark is definitely an important card in these matchups, but as we have seen so many times in the Esper Mirrors, it's all about Planeswalkers to begin. Then all yeah. of a sudden, you, you take a look at your six mana spells. In this particular list that Kai is playing, he's got a Command the Dreadhorde. He, of course, does not have any copies of Bolas' Citadel because nobody else does except for Shota. Shota has yeah. an advantage because he has more six mana spells. Two Bolas' Citadels, two Command the Dreadhordes, as opposed to just one Command the Dreadhorde on the other side. The games are going to yeah. go long, and then one of those six-mana spells is going to dominate the game. There's a lot of pressure on Kai Buda to get the pressure on early and started. Otherwise, the strong top end from Yasuoka's list will easily overpower. Who will win? Let's head to Becca to find out. All right, let's welcome these two competitors to the stage. One is going to move on to day three, and one is going home. We've got the Hall of Famer with two Pro Tour wins under his belt, Shoto Yasuoka! And a fellow Hall of Famer, but this one has seven Pro Tour titles under his belt. One of the greatest players of all time, Kai Buddha. To find out who's going to win this match, let's go to our boys in the booth, Marshall and Paul. Thank you, Becca, and welcome back to the booth here at a Mythic at Championship 3. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion. Got an elimination match lined up for you here, Paul. Uh, I know that this is actually all just for you, right? <laughs> this is for your viewing pleasure, and you're kind enough to allow our viewers at home to watch as well. Kai Buda versus Shoti Asoka. This is a big one. Oh, yeah. Keeping yourself alive, of course, is the name of the game here, and these players are not in the same position that the players that we watched in the prior round were. This is lose and go home, win and stay alive. Exactly. So both players fighting to stay on just for the chance to make it into the Sunday top four. Yeah, two extremely experienced players here. Of course, Kai Booty, one of the most celebrated players we've ever had in Magic the Gathering having won seven Pro Tours. It's a it's a unfathomable number at this point. Unlikely to ever be eclipsed or even close to it. And sitting across from him, Shoti Asoka, one of the most respected players in the game. Absolutely. He's no slouch himself. We just have two Hall of Famers actually just going at it. You know, kind of the old school players who've been playing the game for quite some time, but proving that they still have it here 
you know, still alive deep into Mythic Championship 3. Shota won a Pro Tour back in the day, a couple years ago. He did. Yeah. He did with a deck that nobody else won a single match with. For Hero, for Kai, but on the bottom part of your screen is Shota playing Esper Control. And not just Control, he's playing the most controlling version of Esper Control of anybody in the field. Oh, yeah, and he has just... <laughs> he's playing Bolas's Citadel at the top end of his curve. <laughs> not only that, I mean, you would think, okay, he's playing Bolas' Citadel to replace Command the Dreadhorde. No, he's just playing two of each. Yeah, he, it was... Uh, why not more, he said. Right. He's, and, and he's one of those players where, you know, I don't want to lose the control mirror. He's kind of known as the guy who loves playing control decks that beat other control decks at the expense of percentage points against aggressive matchups. He'll shave a wrath. He'll shave a removal spell just so he can fit in that extra counter spell or that extra card draw spell. I think he figures, you know, I'll figure it out. Yeah. Right? I'll sort out how to beat these these red <laughs> decks or whatever, but That's this what is the, the part where you need that raw power. Right. You, you can use the sideboard for all the Cry of the Carnariums that you want, but for the, the main deck, and there it is. That's the type of card that you want in this matchup. <laughs> there it is. Bolas' Citadel goes into hand for Shota. Are we going to get a chance to see that in action? Time will tell for the, for the time being. It's Teferi Time Raveler for Shota and then one for Kai as well. Yeah, and Shota's in a good position here. If he can draw land number six, this is a really good opportunity here for Shota to run out Thought Erasure, make sure he hits land number six, and then run out Bolas' Citadel. So he gets the D-Spark. The coast is clear. And now if he draws land number six, he can just slam Bolas to Citadel and get try to get super ahead on cards with that card. He might even play out this Teferi just to make sure he can hit land drop number six. It looks like you're right, Paul. He's going to run that out there right now. Oh, I guess he can oh. just wait till next turn. Just going to plus and then minus next turn, sure. And, and Kai has nothing. He doesn't have a way. Are we going to see Bolas' Citadel in play next turn? Oh, there, there it is. is. Drowned Catacomb off the top of the library, and Bolas' Citadel has landed. All Kai can do is give a knowing nod, but he knows how bad this is. Right now, Shota is at 20 life. And the top of his library is his playground. He can do whatever he wants, although he did find Command the Dreadhorde, and he's going to cast it. And there's a Teferi Hero of Dominari, which, was, which Kai used a Thought Erasure on. So now we got Teferi Hero of Dominari in play as well. Another command on cards. top, come on. This is ridiculous. I mean, he's already at nine. Oh, and another <laughs> bullet to sit it on. Yeah, that was an 11 life uh, Teferi there. That was not cheap. But life points, you know, not that important in this matchup. And I think, I think at this point, I mean, it, it, Shota is just going to be way too far ahead on cards here. Oh, look There's at this. There's Revitalize. That, that's that's that gain a life. Too. Yeah, that's gain a life. life. <laughs> that's funny. And you can see the look on Kai's face as he <laughs> says, well, this isn't how I drew it up. Three lands in hand. Oh, look at this. And now he's got Elder Spell to get the Time wow. Raveler off the battlefield. He's very close to embleming that Teferi Hero of Dominaria. Yeah, he's already used it this turn. But with this Elder Spell, next turn he'll be, he'll be ready to go for the ultimate. And the reason why he's doing it now is Teferi Time Raveler was sitting at three, meaning that he could have bounced Bolas to Citadel on his turn. Oh yeah. my goodness. Also, Look he does at this. it now just to do this. And Basilica Bell Hunt just costs one life every time he casts it because it gains three life and it costs four.
This is absolutely incredible. Here's Thought Erasure. Does he want to spend a life to cast it? Just need to make sure he doesn't go down to three life here because of the potential of a yeah. top decked Oath of Kaya. Yeah, he does want to cast it, but he wants to do it on Kai's turn. Thank you very much. So let's get. Oh, oh and it was it Oath is. of Kaya, but it's not going to stay in his hand. It's going to get taken away from Thought Erasure. And I think he's actually going to go ahead and draw that Thought Erasure there as well. Yeah, I mean, the only way he can lose is top deck Oath of Kaya's, and given that he can go instant speed to fairy, time, uh, or sorry, draw step Thought Erasure, that just ensures that Kai can't draw anything to get out of this. Yeah, that's going to lock this thing up because we now have to fairy Hero of Dominaria at the ready. Ultimate time, bingo. And now every single time Shota draws a card, he's going to be exiling permanence, and this one is going to be in the books. And by the way, let's not forget that these Basilica Bell Haunts are actually quite a quick clock. Six damage per turn as well, so this game is well and truly in hand for Shota. And Teferi sacrificing himself to kill a land because Shota can replace it with a replacement Teferi Time Raveler. I imagine this is going to be ticked up so that he can get that draw step Thought Erasure going to prevent Kai from having any outs to come back in this game. He's going to have to discard a cast down on end step. What was the draw step? It was a Teferi Hero of Dominaria, but of course that's going to hit the bin. And that should be just about it because Kai is going to take six damage and lose at least one land here. Well, there's another one minimum. They just want to go for all the white sources here. Free land off the top. That Bolas of Citadel drawing showed us something like seven or eight cards over the course of this game. Drawing and casting. Right. Just a black experimental frenzy. <laughs> <you know? laughs> it does damage to you instead of to your opponent. <laughs> but <laughs> Wow. What an incredible showing here for Shota in game number one. Doing it exactly as he's drawn it up. Now he's returning his own stuff just to make sure that Kai has no lands left over, or at least minimum. Drowned Catacombs now going to hit the graveyard for Kai Buda. And, uh, well, two lands left for Kai? Yep. Three lands, excuse me. There's Hero of Precinct 1, and that is game number one going to Shota. Yasoka drew it up exactly like he planned. So we're going to hit up sideboards before I do want to remi uh, remind you that uh, Magic Core Set 2020 is coming to Arena on July 2nd and to pre-releases on July 5th. If you're interested, magic.wizards.com slash core2020 for more info. Now, important stage here, sideboarding, Paul. Yeah, and uh, Shota knows the cards that he wants in. Of course, Revitalize, not especially good in this matchup, kind of mostly for the mono-red matchup, but still looking to keep some of these sweepers in um, because of... Hero of Precinct 1, that's one of the ways you can lose in the matchup. Kind of Hero of Precinct 1 just kind of going off. And you know that Shota is kind of better set up for the late game with that Bolas of Citadel that we saw. So he's kept in currently one Kai's Wrath, one Cry, but he's kind of tweaking with the numbers there. You also see a pair of Cast Down that he can use to kill a Hero of Precinct 1 before he gets out of hand. Yeah, it's more important to have access to those cast downs, especially when you're going to be on the draw. You need to make sure that you have a two-mana answer to the Hero Precinct 1. On the flip side, if you're on the play, you don't, you, you can actually just wait till having the answer on turn three because they're not going to, you know, they go turn to Hero Precinct 1, you play your third land, then you can play your Oath of Kaya, your Teferi Time Raveler, get it off the board before they get the chance to make a token. So he's got the Oaths and then one Cry and, and, the, uh, and the cast down. And we are heading into game number two. Now, I mentioned it at the onset, but this is a good time to remind you that this is an elimination match. So Kai Bude at this point is facing elimination from the tournament unless he can win this game and the next against the Japanese Hall of Famer Shota Yasuoka. This is going to be rough for Kai. That game one did not go how he wanted. Right, but might have a better chance here, depending yeah, on Kai's like hand, because Shota is definitely going to six here, I think. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to guess what showed up, man. He'll, <laughs> yeah. he'll get you. <laughs> and I think he, he's going to he keep did. this. Yeah, this looks like a nice keep. He's got cast down for any potential hero of Precinct 1 and then double Narset to fuel his hand later. And uh, there we go. There's a cast down off the top of the library. Curious to see if Kai wants to just slam hero here or if he wants to use duress. And he's just going to go ahead and play hero of Precinct 1 before passing the turn back. 
Oh, look at that. Cast down. Hello. Yeah, interesting. Kai could have actually chosen to lead with the rest and then maybe play the hero of Precinct 1 to kind of protect it, but wanting to be a little more proactive here. Now, now he has a duress and he review, he, he sees well, some kind of bad news, double Narset and another duress. So he can't really take Shota off of a game plan here completely. Yeah, so he can take Narset and just kind of hopes that Shota just goes ahead and runs out Narset, but oh, now, now this is just perfect for Shota because he doesn't even need to play out the Narset anymore. He can just go to rest Dottie Razor, strip Sh uh, Kai's hand entirely of threats, and then run out Narset next turn. That's right. Wow, the Thotty oh, Razor too. Oh, but this wow. actually worked out beautifully Interesting. Here. For Kai Buda, he gets to use, well, he gets to cast a Dovin's Veto in a relevant manner here, which it looked like he may not be able to, and take down the remaining Narset. So now, well, it's all reactive spells for both players. Elder Spells and Thought Erasures. Here's Duress to take away Elder Spell from Kai Bude, but both players are down to nothing. Yeah, really interesting that he chose to just run that, run that out there because, you know, if he does have reactive cards in hand, you can just use the Hand Deception to get that counter out of his hand, get those Elder Spells out of his hand. Kai sees, well, you've got Elder Spell and another Thought Erasure, but Kai probably figures anything that he draws, he's just going to play out of his hand anyway. Yeah, and we are... In top deck mode. I love it. This is actually really exciting. D-Spark, another reactive card, isn't going to do anything here. So no play for Shota. He knows that Draft <laughs> Catacomb's the last card in hand. Another land off the top of the library for Kai. He passes it back. Land off the top now from Shota. He's going to pass it back, not even bother. There's Oath of Kaya. That's not doing a whole lot here either. So land go First from Kai Buta. And another <laughs> land for Shota Yasoka. Let's pass the turn back. I'm seeing a pattern here. Land off the top of the library. First person to draw threat here. And once again, another reactive spell. Oh my goodness. This time Kai did not play his land. It's Oath of Kaya off the top of the library, though, for uh, for Shota. And I guess he's going to give me a moment to catch my breath by casting Thought Erasure. He's like, you know what? This feels about the right time where I think Kai probably will have something. Mm -hmm. And now Shota has the mana to cast Bolas of Citadel if he does find one. Ooh, Godless Shrine off the top of the library for Kai Buddha is not going to get him anywhere. May as well play that Drowned Catacomb since he knows about it anyway. <laughs> Godless Shrine. Really exciting magic here, folks. Hey, this really is building up to magic. something great. There's okay. Narset Parter of Veils. There we go. All right. So Narset hits the battlefield. And Kai's going to immediately minus it. He will lose it to the Oath of Kaya, most likely. And a D-Spark is what he found. Wow, three more lands in that pile as right. well. We were going to be here for a while. Another land off the top of the library. But Oath of Kaya for Shota is going to take care of Narset Parter Veils before playing a land and passing the turn with D-Spark left for both players. Oh, and there's a replacement okay. Narset with no answers in sight. This could be the one that breaks the dam open here for Kai Buda. Teferi, Command the Dreadhorde, anything? How about Time Raveler? Teferi Time Raveler is very, very strong. Thought okay. Erasure is also an option if he... Does he know that... He doesn't know he about do, the D-Spark. He doesn't know... If he doesn't know about the D-Spark, yeah, he should definitely just play out the Teferi Time Raveler here. And if you notice, Shota just continuing to play out all of his lands because of the fact that he has that Bolas of Citadel in his deck. So he just wants to set himself up in a, posi in a position where he can top deck it and slam it. All right, here's Thought Erasure now from Kai. That's going to take away that D-Spark and leave Shota empty-handed. But boy, can that turn around quickly if he can find Anything. a Bolas' Citadel off the top of the library. I don't know how stacked the graveyards are, but Command the Dreadhorde has to be well worth it at this point Oh, absolutely. As well. And oh, uh, the, the Bolas' Citadel won't be especially strong because Kai currently has the D-Spark. So even if Shota draws it, he probably won't play it until he can get that D-Spark out of Good Kai's point. hand. Yeah, well, he doesn't have that problem anyway, does he, right. Paul? There's a planes off the top of the library before oh. passing it back. And there's Command the Dreadhorde. Now, how good is this, though? Like, there's no there's no Teferi Hero of Dominaria's lur lurking around, right? It's a bunch of Narsets. Oh, I was wrong. There is a Teferi there, there Hero of Dominaria. There is a Teferi. Dominaria. It's right there. Thank you, Paul, for that You're sick welcome. call. And, uh, yeah, so that was an absolutely... Well, let's find out here. So, Narset can grab this Teferi... And then is it better for him to just cast it? Oh, he's looking at Dovin's Veto to protect his uh, his um, Command the Dreadhorde. It depends on what Planeswalkers are currently in the graveyard here. Yeah, because he didn't take that to, to Ferry. So actually, I don't know if there's one in the yard still. It would have had to been taken early on, and I don't believe that there was. But we're going to find out right now. No, it's Narset. 
It's Narset and, a, and hero. a hero of Precinct 1, and he just wants to make sure that he has protection there with the Dovin's Veto. Oh, and he finds Teferi, so okay. Kai now pulling ahead by drawing those Narsets. Oh, and the command that Dreadhorde won turned too late for Shota. Of course, you mentioned this yesterday, Paul. That's one of the big upsides to being the first to command as you clear out those graveyards. Right, and now things are going to be extremely difficult here. I mean, it, it was just one of those situations where the first person to draw a relevant threat likely is going to kind of use that advantage and kind of take over the game. That's what happened with Kai. He got the Narset that allowed him to dig into finding that command, the Dreadhorde, to take over this game. So at this point, Kai just kind of has all of the angles covered here. He's got the D-Spark for pots of possible bullets to Citadel. He's got Dovin's Veto on top of that. So looks to me like Kai is going to be able to pull this one out. I mean, given that he also has a pair of Teferi here of Dominarius in his hand. By the way, very impressed here by Shota. His facial expression <laughs> was exactly the same when he was casting like seven spells in one turn off of Bolas' of Citadel as it is as Kai Bude storms to the victory here in game number two. It feels like there's no way out at this point, simply having drawn too many lands with Kai now drawing multiple cards per turn off of these Planeswalkers. You know, Kai with all the advantages, more cards, more walkers, more creatures, yeah, and Dovin's this is probably Vito. a concession here. Yeah, just yeah. way too many lands for Shoti Ahsoka. So Kai Bude is the first to strike here in game number two as he evens things up. Wow, a game three incoming once again between our two players in this elimination now game. It was an elimination match, but we've upgraded it. Yeah, curious to see what would have happened if, if Shota chose to run out the hand disruption spells first instead of playing out that Narset on turn three. Curious too. I think things would have gone much differently. Of course, yeah, definitely. You know, you start. There's this uh, concept in in uh, standard where the advantages you have can kind of snowball. They can right. grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And we actually saw that from Kai. Right. It started off with a Narset, and next thing you know, he had six cards in hand and two Planeswalkers. Yeah, Narset is incredible in this matchup. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it just gets you two extremely relevant threats, and it just sits there on the table, like, just completely messing up your game plan on top of that. The fact that you can't draw cards of, off of Time Raveler and Hero of Dominaria is a very big deal. Oh. This has got to be a mulligan here for Kai Bude. He's staring at six lands and a command the Dread Horde. Now he's got Thought Erasure, Teferi, and four lands. Still not amazing, but definitely a keeper. Keeping that too. So yeah. decent mulligan here for Kai. Actually, he has the exact same hand Shota had mm -hmm. in the previous game. Shota has a pretty clean game plan here with Duress, Keep Alive, and then cast Command the Dreadhorde at some point. Okay, another Command the Dreadhorde, perhaps not what he wanted to see off the top of the library there, but he can protect. Oh, it's interesting. This is actually really interesting because the Thought Erasure doesn't do that much against him at this point with the double command, the Dreadhorde. Right. Teferi, very important, but Dovin's Veto can also stop command, so he's going to go for the most outright powerful option, though, with Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, leaving himself with D-Spark, Oath of Kaya, double command, the Dreadhorde, and a Glacial Fortress yeah. before passing it back. Shota's hand doesn't do a whole lot, so just making sure that if the game does go long, Kai can't go hand disruption into Teferi. Mm. And also by getting rid of that Teferi and putting it into Kai's graveyard, Shota might be able to cast one of those Commander Dreadhordes to steal the Teferi. Of course, he's, uh, he's just playing the long game here. Oh, yeah. So Kai Bude now does have access to both Dovin's Veto and Thought Erasure. And it's not you know, as easy as you would imagine. It's not just use the Thought Erasure here because there is the chance that Shota has two, three mana Planeswalkers in hand. And if that happens, then even if you Thought Erasure away one of them, Shota can simply untap and play another one. So you know, there is some consideration to keeping up Dovin's Veto that turn. It looks like he's going to use the combination of Thought Erasure plus Dovin's Veto to nullify these Command the Dread Hordes over the course of this game. He's taking away one. Normally, when you see a player fire off a hand disruption spell and there's two copies of a given spell, they actually will let you keep both because taking one doesn't do a whole lot. But I think the Kai recognizes that he does need to just sort of get through all these commands, so taking one away right now is beneficial. Ooh, Thought Erasure, though, off the top of the library. He's actually not going to cast it, though. Kai playing for the long game here, too, also taking 
the command to Dread Hordes. And Kai now has a nice little setup here. Hero Precinct yep. 1 with Oops. Dovin's Veto backup. Yeah, now there's multiple answers here, though, if you're sitting in show to seed. He can either go for Oath of Kai, a Cry of the Carnarium, or start to clear the way with Thought Erasure. And given that you don't want to allow Shota to surveil, I think you just want to fire off the Dovin's Veto, make that token here, yeah, kind of hope for the best. Given the missed land drop here from Shoti Asoka, that makes a lot of sense, though. It does look like Kai is completely out of gas, though he is ahead with three power on board. Cry of the Carnarium should be able to clean up the mess here, though, as uh, Shota clear, cleared the way last turn. But Kai has a lot of opportunity here to just draw something big off the top. Yeah, something like a Teferi or an Ugin or whatever would get the job done. Here's Basilica Belhunt, though, leaving Kai Bude with just D-Spark in hand after the trigger. How ability. quickly does show to play? He just drew it, it not, like a half second. He just dragged it right onto did, the battlefield. Did ever actually make it to his hand? I'm like, not even sure. It was like on a quick did he round catch trip. It? <laughs> There's Oath of Kai, definitely not what Kai wanted to see at this point. It doesn't even deal with the bell hunt on the battlefield, so he's going to have to just despark that bell hunt away with nothing else going on before passing the turn back. Can show to find some source of card advantage oh, or some wow. lands. Another Basilica bell hunt. Okay, this one is starting to lean towards Shota Yasuoka. Big draw steps here for Kai Bude facing elimination, and it's a watery grave. That ain't it. Yeah, and Shota, if you can find just two lands in a row, this command to Dreadhorde is going to be huge. Yeah, it could devastate this board. There's land number one. It's a swamp off the top of the library, and he gets to start beating down as well. There's all, is there, there might even be a consideration of playing out Thought Eraser here just to make sure you hit land number six to cast command to Dreadhorde for the oh, win. Oh, that's interesting. He is going to stay gonna patient, though. Is there a big draw? Yes, Narset Parter avails off the top of the library here for Kai. Could be stage one of him getting back into this game. Let's see what he can hit. Narset is going to hit Teferi Time Raveler or the Elder Spell. Yeah, and given the board, I don't think... Kai I mean, do does have the mana to cast Teferi. Wouldn't do a whole lot, given that there, there's the right. bell hunt in play. You don't really want to be bouncing that. He could tick it up. He could tick it up to protect the Narset for a turn and just kind of force Shota to replay that Basilica bell hunt. These he are critical junctures down the stretch in this elimination game. Alternatively, he can keep the he can choose to get Elder Spell because he knows that Shota's one mana away from casting Command the Dreadhorde and getting a bunch of Planeswalkers onto the battlefield. Okay, he went for the Time Raveler. He's going to play it. And he is going to send that Basilica he Bell to land here. back to hand. Oh, wow, that and was the perfect draw. Found Duress, which is the wow. only thing he could cast That was deck. huge. He's going to take this Command the Dreadhorde. Wow, that was fantastic stuff from Kai. And there was a oh land on top, goodness. too, Paul. That was such a timely Duress off the top. He only had one mana left. That was the only thing he could cast. Right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Then he uses Oath of Kai to kill Narset. And now, OK, well. An isolated chapel, but to fairy time raveler plus play my land and say go. Yeah, but Shota went from looking like he was going to be extremely ahead because he was he had so many good draws there too. Now it being you know somewhat close-ish. Yeah, he has, he's slightly ahead, but not nearly to the point where he was a couple of turns ago. Yeah, he has two spells in his hand, neither of which particularly tempting to cast a big draw here. Well, it's a thought erasure for Kai. I mean that's not bad. It's going to get that D spark out of Shota's hand, meaning that, that he if, has more outs. if he draws something like a Teferi, he can, he, can, uh, he can play it and not be worried. Oh, and it looks like we're going to see an instant speed Thought Erasure here to get that D-Spark out of Shota's hand. And of course, the underrated part of Thought Erasure is that Surveil 1, which right at this point in the game is huge for Kai. Very Any big. surveilling he can do like that. Yep. He just put a Godless Shrine into the graveyard. He would have had to draw that. It would have been a complete blank at this point. Yeah. In the meantime, though, Shota in good shape, being ahead on board with that Basilica Belhond and able to attack oh, look to at this. Fairy and talk surveil. about Surveil, right? <laughs> Keep. Keep Narset, not yep. a bad one. Go, and this is a big draw step for Kai. He found ugh, Hero of Precinct 1. Could be worse, but could be a lot better because Narset Parter Avails is going to hit the battlefield now for Shoti Asoka. What can he find? Bolus's oh, Citadel. Can he cast it? One, two, three, one four, short. five. He cannot cast it this oh, turn. Oh, no. We need to see Hand oh, of Fruction. Command and there's the Command the Treadhorde off the top of the library for Kai Bude. What can he get back? 
He can get a t I mean, he's at 15 here. There's not a whole lot of direct damage. He just needs to make sure that he stays at maybe above three life here. So Keep he can get back Narset, Little T, and Big T? And that would put him to four life. Yes. <laughs> wow, what a draw here from Kai. But keep in mind, remember, Shota still has Bolas of Citadel yes. here in hand. Yes, this, these two do not fight against each other like two commands do. And Bolas of Citadel at 29 could very easily take over the game for Shota if he hits a bunch of spells. And he even has that Narset in play. If he finds two lands in a row, he can then use the Narset to kind of reset the top of his deck. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's Surveil does that as well. There is a lot that can go right here, but still, oh Kai my goodness. is staying All right. in this. The trio of Planeswalkers hits the battlefield, and these activations are going to dictate what we have going forward. He would absolutely love to see some way to get that Bolas of Citadel out of hand. Remember, he can't draw any cards currently because Shota yep. has Narset in play. That's so right. he's going to have to use Teferi's minus ability if he does want to draw a card with Teferi Time Raveler. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> These are the Haymakers. He used Narset's ability but found Teferi Time Raveler. That is not a card drawn, so that still works even if you're facing down an opposing Narset. And Kai has used one of his timeouts here. but I will say this is the time to use them. Probably. Yeah, probably. elimination yeah. against a tough player in game three. Everything has to go right from Kai. From I mean, here Kai on out. really needs to find a hand disruption spell. I think he has to use Teferi minus on Narset, then minus Teferi to try to find Thought Erasure or Duress off the top to get that Bolas of Citadel out of his hand. Yeah, he or knows, draw Dovin's Veto. That's right, because he knows it's there. Remember that. He knows Bolas of Citadel is there, so Kai knows exactly what he needs to do here. That's and not he it. Missed. He found a Drowned cat, drown Catacomb, and even though Kai had a great turn there, you got to like Shota's chances on 27 life with Bolas' Citadel <laughs> on the, about to hit it's the battlefield. It's Bolas' Citadel time. Let's see what this gets us. I mean, this is the card that we've been hyping up in Shota's deck all this time. What is he going to find with this Citadel? All right, here we go. Bolas' Citadel on the stack and now on the battlefield. First it's a land, then it's the Narset. Oh, that's a reset. And he does need it here because he's got another land up there. There's Teferi That's Time an extra Raveler, card. which is another one. There is Narset on the other side of the battlefield. And another land here for Shota. Okay, so he's going to miss here. He can't actually draw an additional no, card because Narset's on the other side. He can, however, play Teferi and then bounce his own Oath of Kaya to play it next turn to get that Narset off the battlefield. Another thing we, we should keep in mind, though, it doesn't look like it'll get there at least this turn, is that Bolas' Citadel <laughs> has an activated ability. <laughs> if he can get to 10 permanents that aren't lands, he could just kill Kai, who's now at four life. Is it even possible to get turn permanents in play with this deck? I don't know. There's no Hero <laughs> Precinct 1, so it's, it's extremely difficult. <laughs> and a lot of them are legendary. Right, and like you can't <laughs> sacrifice lands, so... Uh, that's funny. You're probably right. He may not have 10 unique permanents in the whole library, but... I'm just going to keep it in mind in case. Yeah, and I think, yeah, he wants to bounce his Oath of Kaya, keep it in hand so that he can use it to remove this Narset or Teferi here of the... Oh, is there's the, oh my Elder goodness, the Elder Spell, spell off the top. He can, he can emblem the Teferi now. He can cast Elder Spell, target the four Planeswalkers in play. Teferi will go to nine, and then he can minus eight to have Teferi emblem. That's huge. Wow, what a draw what a step draw. for Kai Bude here. He finds the Elder Spell. Hey, might as well use your Planeswalkers first, he says. Now, this does mean, though, that Shota will get one more turn. No, he won't. Citadel, he right? found Teferi Hero of Dominaria oh, here. So look now at that. he's going to Elder Spell, remove all the Planeswalkers, Emblem, play Teferi, plus one, draw a card, exile, Bolas of Citadel in play. And at that point, I think the game's over. Kai Bude with the top deck of the tournament here with the Elder Spell is about to make fireworks happen. You put him up against the wall and he is going to defend himself. Here comes the Elder oh Spell to my wipe goodness. away what a two draw of his here. own and two of his opposing Planeswalkers. And you even got a reaction out of Shota Yasaoka there. That is exactly what he didn't want to see. He knows what a devastating okay. turn of events this Shota is. Shota still has a shot here. He does have Oath of Kaya in hand. If he finds another one or finds a way to bounce it, Kai is sitting at four life. That is the way that he can he still can win. burn him out from this point? He can Esper burn. We talked about it before. There's still a shot here. But we know that Watery Grave is on top, so he can't yeah. do it next turn. 
So the clock is very real here. His permanents are going to start dwindling as well as his life total thanks to this Hero of Precinct 1. And Kai says, what do you got? Here comes Basilica Bellhaunt to stem the bleeding on the ground. Now he can play Oath of Kaya. The question is, does he just go upstairs? Or I feel like you have to. Now he's doing, he's doing yeah. a count here. How many Teferis do I have in my deck? How many have been exiled? I mean, I just don't see him beating a Teferi emblem here in the in the late no. game. No, if he if he kills the Hero of Precinct One, this game will play to so his outs. Quickly. And upstairs he goes. Kai says, "All right, we've got ourselves a sweat. Play a land, pass the turn back. There's another permanent going away. Does he just need to take care of the oath here to reduce the chance of any bounce effects? Well, he knows he can't get uh, get the job done with with the the the." Doing the land destruction plan. Yeah. So he chose to actually remove Basilica Belhan in case ah. Shota draws Cry of the Carnarium. Because if he did draw Cry of the Carnarium, that would still be enough damage to get him for a lethal point of damage. And he's also able to take out the Oath of Kaya itself, forcing Shota to draw Oath of Kaya or some way to find it. And Kai just needs to find, if he finds a Dovin's Vita or his own Oath of Kaya, he could put himself out of range or Absolutely. defend himself. This is incredible stuff. <laughs> from That's the German not juggernaut. No, he found Arguel's blood fast. Really not what he wanted to see. Although, now that I say that, he can flip it, it and use transform. it to gain some life. Yeah, I mean, he needed to gain a decent amount before it would really add up for him. But hey. All right, Shota still has a chance here. He's he's very far behind here because of all the permanents in play on Kai's side. But if he draws Oath of Kaya, he needs to find Oath of Kaya off the top of the library. Narset would help. There's a duress. That is not what he wanted to see. Still at 23 life. And we're going to see that Argos Bloodfast transform, but with only two toughness at the most, uh, Shota will still have a draw step. Command <laughs> That's also the not going to be a card. Is not it either. And it looks like we're going to get to one more shot here for Shota, because after that, Kai can actually start sacrificing creatures to put himself clear of it in response if he needs to. Right, so now what Kai can do is sacrifice a token, yep. go to two, then sacrifice Hero of Precinct 1, go to four, which would then put him out of Oath of Kai range. Right, and the thing is he can leave it up, right? He can right. just say, if you draw the Oath of Kai, then I'll sack the hero. Otherwise, I'm going to keep hitting you with it like this. So this could be the last window here for Shoti Asoka to find Oath of Kai. He needs Oath of Kai. How many does he have left in his deck? He's already used in one. the tournament. And it looks like he has three in his deck. Yes, he does. He has exactly three, none in the board. Narset would help. Narset would be big. Teferi. Teferi Time Raveler. He can draw a card off of that. He's going to go for Duress first. He's making sure he has mana to Duress, Teferi, minus draw a card, and still have mana to Earth of Kaya. But I believe that he does. He does. Wow, this is about as close as they get. Two all-timers going at it. Neither one wants to go home. The loser of this game is going to be sent packing, and they refuse to lose. And he's also thinking, is there a cheap cantrip spell that I can draw off of Teferi that could then also find me with Kaya? I don't uh, think he has it, sure. so that's why he's running out to Duress. But that's what he was thinking about there. That's what that pause was. Okay, so here's Duress to take away, well, in this case, Command the Dreadhorde, and here comes Teferi. All right, this is huge. He, re he needs to find it this turn. because no, This Kai, is the window. This is the turn. He needs Oath of Kaya here. If he doesn't, Kai can go up to four life. So Kai's at two right oh, he's now. He's at two, okay. So targeting nothing or nothing? And he said, I don't want to target anything. He doesn't. And he drew Hero of, uh, Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, but Kai sitting now at two life with. Right, right. He the has the ability to, to instant speed. More. Yeah, he, he has the ability to do it at instant speed. And at this point, Shota doesn't have any other options here. Right. Remember, if, if uh, Shota decided to try to take out one of those tokens, Kai could simply oh, sacrifice it in and response. And that's it right there. Dovin's the veto card. should lock this up. Unbelievable. What a game. Kai beating Bolus's Citadel with Shota sitting at 29 life. Incredible run by Kai Bude here, and he will keep it alive. It looks like he has got himself into the safe zone here with enough life total plus counter magic that it almost doesn't matter at this point what Shota draws, short of some miraculous string of events that I can't imagine at this point. Yeah, and now he has the ability to cast an instant speed thought eraser too. So now Kai 
has is going to lock this up and he's going to stay alive you know incredible a land off the top of the library for Shoti Asaoka and an instant speed thought erasure to take away big Teferi from his hand puts him on nothing and of course the thing that is overhanging this entire game is that Teferi emblem every turn that goes by Shota is losing permanence and they're not coming back and just just additional insurance here oath of Kaya off the top meaning Kaya's now can just fire it off and sit at a comfortable five life here and not have to worry about a potential series of both of Kaya's that Shota could draw. Wow, incredible from Kai Buda. Anybody who doubted him coming into the tournament is surely a fool as he is going to stay alive for yet another round in miraculous fashion as well. Now he's just adding on. He's got Oath of Kaya, Oath of Kaya plus Ugin. And this one is going to be in the books. Another great run for, for Shota Yasuoka, but it looks like it is going to end here at the hands of Kai Buda. <laughs> Unbelievable I'm, stuff, Paul. Things look this so incredible. incredible. He was at like 26 with Bolas' Citadel. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe that Kai found a win here. I mean, he had to top deck two perfect cards in yeah, a row. the Duress and the Elder Spell? No, no, it was Command the Dread Horde oh, you're into right. the Elder Spell you're right, with to the, set that up. To set that whole thing up. Unbelievable game and a real pleasure to watch. Search for his Kanta is too little too late. Shota says good game, and Kai Buda earns the victory. He will survive to fight another day. Shota Yasoka, another great run for him, but it does end here. I will not forget that one anytime soon, Paul. Oh, no. I mean, that was just an incredible match. And just the back and forth there, right? Because, you know, it, it, the, the matchup goes from extremely boring, where nobody does anything early, to all of a sudden people just slamming their five mana Planeswalkers, their six mana over to the top sorcery, <laughs> their five mana so Planeswalker plus two mana over to the top sorcery. I, I mean, know. the game was just completely wild. I mean, I was really excited to see what Bolas of Citadel could do, but, but Kai just going back-to-back -back perfect draws <laughs> to be able to pull out that game. That was insane. Not only that, he there, there was still an option. There was still a turn uh -huh. for, for Shota to potentially go off at the Bolas of Citadel, but, but Kai, on top of that, found an additional Teferi Hero of Dominaria yes. to play it and draw a card to get that Citadel off the yeah, board. Yeah, that was critical because, remember, he needed to Elder Spell four Planeswalkers <laughs> off the battlefield. Two That's got to be the record this and weekend, two right? two his opponents, right, just to get Teferi, who was on one loyalty, the full eight up to nine and then back down to one. And a little emblem sitting on the side of the battlefield was the ticking clock over that match. And it ended up winning Kai Buda the match. Becca is with Kai right now. That's right. Kai Buda. Oh, my goodness. That was insane. Uh, you now just have one more game to play to be seated in, in tomorrow's game. How? Walk me through what happened in that last match. Well, another Esper These games are pretty close. I got a bit of uh, better draws in the second and third game, and yeah, I mean, it usually comes down to like one player drawing one more big spell, like there's this card coming back and forth, and then planeswalkers, and everyone deals with each other's planeswalkers, and like one player has one more big spell, and like the turn before he was probably going to lock up the game, I finally drew my command, the Dreadhorde, and could then emblem my Teferi, and just from there, it just spiraled out of control for him. Yeah, it really, truly did. I mean, it, how did that feel? Because you saw the Bolas, Bolas' Citadel go off in the previous game, or maybe the game before that. Uh, were you at all worried about that little tweak to the Esper control? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly good in the mirror. It's good against me, I think. And obviously, I was kind of down after the first game. I mean, he very easily destroyed me. Then I won the second game, but now he's on the play. And then my draw wasn't very good. And then, like, he keeps missing stuff. And, like, he keeps missing draws. He didn't misplay or anything. And then my draws kept getting better and better. And like, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good feeling when you like think, maybe I'm going to win. I'm pretty likely to win. And then you draw the counter spell and you're like, all right, not, now I'm winning. This is, this is it. I'm going to win. Yeah, it was really exciting from our side. And it was even exciting at the beginning when we could see what each of you kept drawing. And it was, no, just another land. No, just another land. And then uh, Thought Erasure, and then Thought Erasure. Yeah, really exciting stuff. Now, what do you think about the matchup with Is It Phoenix? You're playing Jean-Emmanuel Dupra to get into day three. Uh, I think in general it's slightly favored for Esper for Esper Hero, but um, 
he's got a version with less creatures and more planeswalkers, which I think is bad for me. Especially Sahili is a problem because that's a three mana planeswalker. And my deck is not very good at dealing with three mana planeswalkers because my main removal for them is D Spark, which is only four casting costs and a buff. So he might have a small edge in the matchup, but it's pretty close. Well, you've definitely played very impressively here today. Kai Buddha, a pleasure to speak to you. Congrats on still staying in there in the lower bracket. You stay tuned for more magic after a short break. I'm Christian Haug. I'm a player of the Magic Pro League. My brother had these fancy cards he had been given from a friend. And uh, I looked at these cards and uh, I was hooked pretty fast. When I heard about the Pro League, I couldn't really believe it at first, to be honest. My brother has always been there for me and uh, Magic was just one thing which kept us connected. And he the guy who drives me to the airport every time I have to fly to a tournament, you know. So yeah, I just told him first and afterwards uh, my family who supported me over the years. Four, five, My name is Paulo Vitor de Manda Rosa. I'm 31 years old from Porto Alegre, south of Brazil. I'm a part of the MPL. I started playing Magic 23 years ago. Eventually I started doing better in local tournaments and at some point I won a PTQ. There were a lot of people that made a big difference in uh, you know, getting me to the Pro Tour. I think my mom was the biggest supporter because I was super young when I started, right? So I would not have been able to do it on my own. It was a leap of faith that she took and that I took, but it was easier for me because I was young and didn't know anything. It was much, much harder for her and she took it anyway. So if she wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here. My name is Lee Shi Chen. When I was a kid, I played some other card games. The shop I was playing, I, they introduced me to magic, and I found myself like addicted to magic. I was studying in England as a extreme student, and then I win a GP, and then I just start playing the Pro Tour. That's how I get here. Then Magic Police happens. It becomes a very good opportunity to develop a career here. It's something I unexpected for me, but then it's really a great thing for me as well. And welcome back to coverage of Mythic Championship 3 from Las Vegas, Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Cheon. Boy, that one took a lot out of us, did it not, Paul? Catch your breath. <laughs> but there's, there's a lot more, more magic to but be there's played. there's more. We're not done. <laughs> We're not even close to being done today. In the feature match, we have John Rolf versus Alicia Tian. The same type of situation that we just saw. They played an epic 35 game 30. 35 game, 35 minute game one. We're gonna come in in game number two. So let's jump into that right now and see how things are panning out for two of our MPL players. How did the game go for 35 minutes? It's a mono white deck going up against Esper Control. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> Lee, <laughs> I forgot Lee was on mono white. That is uh, surprising to say the least. But it's not too surprising that given that it was a 35 minute game, John Rolf was victorious in the matchup. Yes. That, that much is clear. Uh, land here for John Wolf, but turn one, Lee Shitian did have Legion's landing to kick things off right into Adonto Vanguard. So a nice start for Lee. Yeah, very, very strong start. I mean, John Wolf will be able to go turn two search into turn three Oath of Kaya or Teferi Time Raveler, but Oath of Kaya not with 
very many good targets here because he can't kill the Adanto Vanguard. He can simply just use it to get the 1-1 one, one token off the battlefield. So I can't imagine John just running out to Fairy Time Raveler instead and just bouncing the token because Lee is going to play a third creature onto the battlefield. That's going to be Adanto Vanguard. And John Rolf definitely does not want Legion's Landing to flip next turn. Yeah, that's the kind of long-term thorn in his side that John is going to have to manage in the early stages of the game. As the game progresses further, there will be bigger threats. But that thing getting transformed is a major problem for these control decks. It just never ends. Yeah, again, really good start here for Lee. I mean, he's drawn five lands, which is not ideal. But he does have Conclave Tribunal there, too, for the Lyra Dawnbringer that John Rolf is hoping can stay in play to block all these creatures. Yeah, if that thing stays in play, well, really tough yeah. <laughs> for Lee Shitian. Oh, okay, never mind. It looks like he's going for the tempo play here, bouncing a Danto Vanguard instead of just killing the token. But a very big draw here, Moment of Craving, which is a very nice, clean way to get a Danto Vanguard off the battlefield. Yeah, so one of those will get taken care of at the very least, though the options here for Li Shi Tian have expanded to History of Banalia this turn, if you'd like. In the meantime, he's going to take Teferi Time Raveler, send him packing right to the graveyard, and get in for three, knocking John down to just 12 life already. And then he's trying to decide between these two. He's only got four mana available, and he's going to go for the more powerful option, it looks like, with History of Benalia. That's a nice one. It is, and John has to use another removal spell here because he doesn't want Legion's Landing to flip. This Hallow Fountain should go into the graveyard, and I expect Oath of Kai here entering the battlefield to just deal with the 2-2 Knight, follow that up with a tapped land. Did you see the stained glass that somebody made? The the artwork, the up and down artwork there on History of Benalia. Somebody made that. Oh wow. Like out of actual stained glass. Wow, that's <laughs> like, that is I sweet. bet that looks amazing. Another option here is to just use Moment of Craving here on Adanto Vanguard. Put yourself in a position to draw something like a Kaya's Wrath to be able to completely clear the board on the following turn. And John Rolf choosing to do it in his main phase in case. Li Shi Tian has something like a negate to counter it. That's right, only one mana available. And another tap land here for Wolf, who passes the turn back. He has been, at least thus far, keeping this dance in his favor. Now, he's taking damage. That part's not great, but he has managed to keep that Legion's landing safely in enchantment mode thus far. Curious to see if Li Shi Tian is willing to deploy one more threat onto the battlefield here. That does leave him vulnerable to a sweeper. If he plays a Danto Vanguard, at least that creature itself is resilient to sweeper other than Cry of the Carnarium. Right. So That's he might just choose to play that out. And if he does, it also gives him lethal next turn. Because he'll have 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 right. with his opponent at 11. And I don't think he's ahead enough to be in a position to play around Cry. So, oh, he's just playing everything. And he's hey. just going, if you have a sweeper, that's it. If you're not going to play around Cry, don't play around Cry. Yeah. And everything's on the battlefield. Oh, my goodness. John Rolf is like, cry me a river just the once. Oh, and he's going for Tribunal on Surge, meaning that John can actually just tap just tap out and play Lyra Dawnbringer, and he'll actually be in an okay position here because Li Shi... Oh, no, never mind. Li Shi Tian has a Law Rune Enforcer in play. That's why he went with the Conclave Tribunal, because if John Rolf taps out for Lyra Dawnbringer, he does have the Tapper in play. So now John's just doing the math and says, if I cast Oath of, of Kaya, kill one of your biggest threats, am I just dead anyway? So he might need to cast... Oath of Kaya and kill Lawrin Enforcer to set up for Lyra Dawnbringer not being tapped down on the following turn. So that would put him to 14, but he's taking 4, 8, 9, 12. 10, 11, 12. I think you find the plan here. <laughs> this is about as sketchy as they get, but uh, this is what it comes down to sometimes, and at least Lee she tends on zero cards. Yeah, but... Wow, I, in Lyra we <laughs> trust, though, buddy. That is a, that a is the plan here. resting on the shoulders of that legendary angel. But she has proven that she can hold it. And a plane's off the top of the library. is not going to do it for Li Shi Tian here either. So he's going to get in for a massive hit here, knocking John Wolf down to just two life. And it's all about Lyra Dawnbringer now. Is Lyra even going to be enough? Oh! Oh, there's Cry the Carnarium off the top of the library. But the funny part is, Adanto the First Ford is now online. Yeah, but this eliminates most of the clock here. If he casts Cry of the Carnarium, he's at two life. Even if Li Shi Tian makes a token, that's not a lethal attack. That can get John Rolf down to one. Then on the following turn, John can untap and slam Lyra Dawnbringer. So now John has to do math. 
If he plays Lyra Dawnbringer this turn, will he still be able to survive an attack for everything? If he blocks the biggest creature, which, which is the Adanto Vanguard, he's going to go up to seven and still just take six from all the other creatures on the battlefield. Yeah, the Let's real see what he question goes here is if Lee can draw Banalish Marshall off the top of the library and just end it. But Banalish Marshall is often a card that gets sideboarded out in this matchup. Ah, okay. So if he has any left, then he may, <laughs> may be able to do it. But in this case, Lee is, uh, well, he's in an easy position here, make a token. And oh, that was closer. actually a huge draw. Oh, my goodness. It's just a one drop, but it was big. I mean, you, you will see John oh, Roth. You see the look in his face. That. Oh, man. So brutal. That was exactly what he needed him not to oh, draw. Oh, that's it. I mean, Li Shitian has this game. He's going to be able to make a token end of turn. John Roth taps out to slam Lyra, and that, it, yep, that's it. Wow, what a draw. That was just an a insane one drop. rip for <laughs> Li Shitian because that one was going to be close, right? right. Any, that could have gone any number of ways, but you got to like John Rolf's chances if Lyra's on the battlefield against just Adanto the first fort. I mean, that game could end very quickly in John's favor. In the, in, instead, a law rune enforcer of all cards. You know what's actually interesting about ends the it. way the, the that game was sequenced out is you know, if he kept the Lyra Dawnbringer in play and blocked the Danta Vanguard, I believe he still would have just gone down to one life. So, had he done that, it's possible then that Lee would have just run out the Lauren Enforcer and then John could have untapped and played Cry of the Carnarium. Wow. Not 100%, but you know, just, just some interesting back and forth. I don't think it was incorrect to run the Car Cry of the Carnarium out there, but, but that was a really, really big draw. And normally we talk about how the mono white deck after a sweeper isn't really able to come back, but I mean, that is the power of Lauru and Enforcer, just you know, kind of innocuous one mana creature that can just do a lot of work because it can just tap down any big threat that's in the way. And remember what me, uh, I talked about how Gideon is just such an annoying threat for the Esper midrange and Esper control decks? It's so bad. John Rolfe is actually keeping two copies of Elder Spell in his deck specifically That's to deal was for. I with was Gideon. I was wondering. I'm like, why does he have that? Because you can't kill it. You're right. And, you know, uh, Lee figured this out as well and decided to pack four copies of Gideon Blackblade in his sideboard. So yep. he knows what's up, too. That is funny. All right, what do we got here? Oath of Kaya, Kaya's Wrath, Lyra, Dawnbringer, Thought Erasure, I mean, he can't cast it, in a five drop. If John Rolfe can, is guaranteed three lands in a row, I, find, I think it's going to be extremely difficult for him to lose this game, given that he can curve Oath of Kaya into Kaya's Wrath into Lyra, but yeah, I don't draw know. Yeah, a Catacomb it, off the top of the library, and we're oh in business. Oh, my goodness, that would be absolutely perfect. And, and he's agonizing over this because there is a very real chance that he can just lose this game by not drawing enough lands. Especially with the brutal consistency of the mono white deck, it. So oh, is he going to mulligan? He let it go. And this hand does hey. have an additional land, and he gets a scry. Yeah, this looks better. Yeah. He gets to play search for his can to kill something with Oath of Kaya. Probably doesn't want that land. Although now that I say that there is a Lyra Dawnbringer, he may consider it. And Lee's hand is fantastic as well. All he needs is land number three. He's got a pair of Gideon Blackblades in hand, and we know just how powerful that card can be in this matchup. Ooh, uh, oh, Legion's looks, landing off the oh, top of the library. So too. now he has one drop into double one drop for the Legion's landing here. And look at this, Lee actually playing out Legion's landing instead of a two power creature here because he doesn't want to get that Legion's landing thought erasured. It's so powerful to be able to flip that Legion's Landing. He's Lee's willing to give up damage. Exactly. Wow. That says a lot. Right. Also, this allows him to protect one of his creatures against the Kaya's Wrath by sandbagging the Dauntless Bodyguard and waiting until turn two. Well, you know what John Rolf wants to find here? Well, there's the Fairy Time Raveler, not the worst either. But a Cry of the Carnarium would be beautiful. But it looks like he's going to keep Teferi. Yeah, Teferi's not bad. He can use the Teferi to bounce the token here, draw a card, just continue to hit his land drops. And again, keeping that Legion's landing from transforming serves two purposes for John. The long-term advantage, but let's not forget the short-term advantage as well. It turns into a land that taps for mana right now. And take a look at the hand here from Lee. He only has two mana available with double Gideon Whoa. Blackblade and History of Benalia. Yeah, but what oh, a big draw. The, oh, and he got of the Cry of the Carnarium. Carnarium. Wow, he didn't actually kill the token, interestingly, there either. Yeah, he bounced the Lawrence Enforcer. Now, Lee has a wealth of options here. He can play Lawrence Enforcer, Convoke out Venerated Loxodon, run out Gideon Blackblade, or play History. Gideon Blackblade it is. 
And Gideon Blackblade makes a lot of sense because it's the best way to play around a sweeper next turn. John Rolf can untap next turn and play something like a Kaya's Wrath, and Kaya's Wrath is not going to be able to deal with that Gideon Blackblade. Four of them came in out of the board, and you can see why. Jeez, there's another decent removal spell there. It's not a land. I think he, I think he might want to graveyard this. Probably looking for an Elder Spell here now. He really needs to find an answer for Gideon Blackblade, or even a land, potentially. Great sideboarding here from Li Shi Tian, putting pressure on John Wolf from, from multiple directions, not just creatures on board, which John has answers to, but also in the form of Planeswalkers that are invulnerable to Sorcery Speed Sweepers. There's Strand Catacomb off the top of the library now for John. And draws like this is where you go, oh, yeah, maybe Kai's Wrath isn't nearly as backbreaking against the mono white aggro deck after sideboard as you would think. You know, you sequence your creatures in a way where Dauntless Bodyguard protects things. You have Adanto Vanguard and you have Gideon Blackblade. Sometimes Kai's Wrath is actually quite poor. Looks like he's considering going for the Oath of Kaya here. Yeah, but Lee firmly in the driver's seat here. That Gideon Blackblade is going to be a huge, huge problem. John does have Lyra Dawnbringer, and he does have a way to kill the Lawrin Enforcer, so that could be an option. But keep in mind, Gideon is now sitting at five loyalty. He's going to tick it up again, and next turn, he has the option of using the minus six effect to just kill Lyra Dawnbringer. Right, and you know, that's one of the reasons why I think it's you feel fine about drawing multiples, is that if you find yourself in that situation, he can minus six and just immediately replay another one. Right. Plus, your win, can, you know, your win percentage tends to go up high enough with Gideon Blackblade that you just want access to as many, as many of those as possible. Just one short second here, and we'll be back. We'll be right back into the match, uh, and we're back. Thank you very much. And yeah, so it looks like Gideon Blackblade is going to be giving Dauntless Bodyguard vigilance, most likely here. And we're going to see a big attack, and then we can even see a follow-up there, given that Lee drew land number four. You can attack with both of the creatures, play out Lauren Enforcer, and then convoke out a Venerated Loxodon. That allows Lauren, uh, That also allows Lee to play around Cry of the Carnarium, as Lauren Enforcer will survive the Cry. And yeah, this is just way too much of a board presence. Now he's got the Lauren Enforcer. John Rolf has to slam down Lyra Dawnbringer, but I mean we have Gideon as a way to kill Lyra Dawnbringer. Lauren Enforcer as a way to tap it. It is now immune to Cry of the Carnarium. So there's just so many different angles of attack here from Lee. Also, keep in mind, next turn, Legion's Landing can also flip. So I'll tell you what, I, I think if, if John knew what he knows now about how these decks were constructed, I don't know if you'd bring Lava, even keep Lyra Donbringer in your 75. You might just want to go with a different option. I mean, yeah. I know it's hard to fathom that given the just outright power of it, but I mean, there's literally multiple answers from this mono white deck right now. Yeah, it's just the diversity of remo uh, just the diversity of permanence that the, the mono white deck has after sideboard. Yeah. You see the Gideon, you see history, legions. Like, there's so many different threats that can kind of threaten to win the game. I mean, I think Lyra Dawnbringer is just so powerful that you have to have it, but I mean... Do you? There's Conclave Tribunal also. Is there no other good options? I mean, I know she's the best option, but we're seeing her... We see two ways right now to mitigate her, plus he could draw another. It's just... I don't know if I'm sold anymore, Paul. I think maybe her time has uh, come and gone here as, for the sideboard. Yeah. I mean, I think she's still strong enough that you have to play. But yes, I think people are more prepared okay. for her. So she's not quite as good as she used to be. But we've seen plenty of games where Lyra Dawnbringer has been able to stabilize board states. That is so. true. We have seen that. And, and Lyra, clearly, one of the more rawly powerful cards that you could put in your sideboard. But in the meantime... There's Adanto the first and this fort should be showing the game. up, and it looks like we're just about done here. <laughs> Dali going, should I play one more creature? I mean, sure. All right. Sky Marcher Aspirant, but is there anything even in the deck here for John Rolf? It certainly doesn't look like it, and that land is not going to get the job done. Li Shi Tian is going to win the second and third game, and with a fist pump, he survives. That's, that was the name of the game there. Yeah, and I mean, 
John had perfectly fine hands in those games. I mean, he was able to curve out Oath of Kaya, gain some life, play some Sweeper, play Lyra Dombringer, but it didn't matter. I mean, Gideon Blackblade did so much work in that match. Yeah. It got in for a ton of damage, and then ultimately also got Lyra Dombringer off the battlefield, and guess what? Just replaced it with another one. Yeah, that's right. Super good utility card out of the sideboard of the mono white deck. Li Shi Tian able to take down that match, and he is standing with Becca Scott. Right, Marshall. I'm here with Lee Shi Tian. Lee, tell me uh, how that went for you. Tell me all about that game you just played with John Rolf. Well, I I make a my my last game is my draw of last game is so good. Like I got two Gideon, and I can play around all the Wrath effect, like uh, even the Cry of Carnarium. So just yeah, just just have a very good job for me. I can tell you're feeling very excited. It's a very good place to be. I mean, you are in the lower bracket, but you just have one more opponent to play against before you'll be moving on to day three. Uh, how are you feeling about um, playing against Mateus Leverato's Simic Nexus? Well, I, I mean, I, I've been playing White Whitney and using Small Creature to beat up all the all the Pink Swatter all, all days. Maybe the small people are mean to beat all the Titan. I love that metaphor. I love where you're going with that. All right. So you went with the Zoria Sagro instead of, say, a Boros Sagro. Why did you make that decision? Like, uh, I think blue is important for, like, mirror match. And, uh, like, I have I got Teferi and Counter Spell in the sideboard is for the Nexus matchup. Those are quite important for me. Like, the matchup is not very good for me, so I, I really need those cards. Absolutely. Well, Li Shi Tian, congratulations on continuing to hang in that lower bracket. Stay tuned for more magic coming up after a short break. My name is Eric Froelich, I'm in the Magic Pro League and the Magic Pro Tour Hall of Fame. It just so happened that my entire fifth grade class really just started getting into magic. I wanted to go to the local game store. Uh, I went with my dad and we bought a nice little starter kit at the time. My dad ended up reading the entire rule book, teaching me how to play, and I played with my classmates. I ended up finding myself winning and winning and advancing all the way to the top eight and qualifying for the Pro Tour at 13 years old. And at that point, I was just fully immersed and wanting to go to every major tournament around me. And that's what I did. I was lucky enough to have really supportive parents who found a way to make sure everything I needed to go to, I was there. Down the numbers are three, and oh, that's okay, going to okay, do okay. it! I'm Javier Dominguez from Spain. I'm the 2018 Gold Champion, and I'm a Magic Pro League competitor. I think what I like most about Magic is that you can play a lot of games, and the games are different between themselves. The game still keeps surprising you. Like, you play the game, and you run into new situations. I really feel the support of my family, my friends, my girlfriend, the Spanish community. It means a lot to me because they're always trying to watch every game I play. This support means a lot because I feel like it gives me strength. I'm Jean-Emmanuel Deprat, 24 years old, from Paris. I'm part of the Magic Pro League. I was taught the game by a cousin uh, when I was 11. Then I started going to a local game store uh, in Paris. And then I started going to PTQs. So after winning any major tournaments like the World Magic Cup, uh, usually the first person I let know is my, is my mom. When I found out I was going to be in the MPL and a, a full-time professional player, she was delighted. My mom believed that you should work in something that uh, makes you happy.
So Mike Segrist holding his breath and Francesco. Hey, I'm Mike Segrist well and I'm part of the Magic Pro League. Segrist. I started playing Magic when I was fifth or sixth grade. My stepbrother at the time found like a $20 bill on the ground and it was next to a game store and he bought fourth edition like double starter deck. He brought it over to my house and we played and I was hooked. It has been a challenge trying to stay at the top levels and my wife's been excellent in it and you know she gives me time to play when she gets home from work. She always knows that I, I need to stay on top of my game. I'm Greg Kowalski, I'm 27, I'm from Poland and I will be playing MPL. I play the Magic with friends, like going to pre-releases, play FNMs. At some point, I had progress in Magic, and now I'm here. I have a great support in terms of parents cheering for me. Even though they don't understand a single, single thing about Magic, they are still cheering for me. They see standings. Hello friends, welcome back to coverage of Mythic Championship 3. There is the trophy that is on the line for the winner of this championship, plus a cool 100K. Hey everybody, I'm Ray Bertholdi. That is day nine, and what a heck of a oh. tournament we've had today. And I do just want to know, that trophy is so cool. I love it. Like, if you played in early esports tournaments, you got an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with your name on it, man. <laughs> they printed it right off. It in wasn't even good card stock. Like, Oh my gosh, and now that is so beautiful. And let's not forget, not only do you get the trophy, not only do you get the money, you also get That's right. the invite to the World Championship at the end of the season. And a lot of players have talked about this, that really it's the glory they're looking for. Yeah, the World Championship, of course, the biggest tournament in Magic. Still out of reach for a lot of players, but a chance to get there this weekend for the winner of this tournament. Uh, for you, what has stood out to you as some of the highlights overall from this uh, championship so far? Uh, well, I mean... There's a mixture of really exciting, joyful things, and kind of, oh, agonizing, painful ones. I think the two that I'm thinking most of is Kai Buddha dropping yeah. first round and then win, win, win. And they have not been easy wins. They have been Absolutely really not. technical games, really difficult. And then uh, my heart aches for Matthias Leverado. That last game against Brad Nelson, I think every single competitive player has been in that position where they – feel intuitively like there's a win somewhere around here and then your brain just starts infusing doubts starting to get worried you know what if this is the one time that there's a counter or a d spark so i shouldn't make that you big overthink play it. and i you know i think paul pointed it out really astutely that there was an inconsistency there there was turns that were too conservative turns that are too aggressive and again every good player has been there it is so hard to stay focused in moments like that and you know what the thing is, he's one of the few players here on day two that hasn't been at this high pressure situation yeah. yet. And a lot of players able to keep it cool and calm, at least on the outside in this kind of environment. But for him, it's his first time on such a huge stage here in Las Vegas. Well, let's take a look at our brackets and take a look at where we've been so far this morning and where we have yet to go today. Here's a look at our upper bracket from earlier this morning. So these were the people with the best records. Uh, to you, what were some of these standout matches that jumped to mind? Well, I mean, even though the matches themselves were not the most elaborate, the most interesting in and of themselves, the path that Shahar Shenhar took, <laughs> who's yes. on to day three. Okay, Shahar actually left the tournament venue once he lost his last match because he was like, that's it, I'm out. I'm there's out. there's bye -bye. no way I'm possibly going to go into the next day. And they actually had to call him. We delayed the ceremony by like two minutes. I actually just did to not bring know him that. Out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they were like, well, let's get him up here. I mean, is he coming? Well, he's coming, so you may as well just, you know, you talk at the desk for a little bit more. And then he comes out and he's just shocked and happy and smiling oh, and just awesome. seeing that cheer. That is sort of the inverse momentum where you're saying to yourself, oh my gosh, these are all free games I'm playing today. It's a different kind of relief. Yeah, it's really cool to see Shahar doing so well as well. Of course, two-time world champion. He's been in these high-pressure situations before, and oh, he's yeah. been able to pull out wins a number of times. And, of course, a reverse story, Greg Orange coming in here to the top 16 oh. undefeated. Oh, the gosh, only person yeah. to do so. And then just goes lose, lose. But there again, take a look. Here are our two players who have locked up the top four so far and a look at our upper bracket there. And you can see that trajectory from Orange. Yeah, I mean, Greg Orange losing in the first round and losing again. And in the exact same way that I was talking about, this sort of relief that Shahar felt. Wow, 
I'm getting free games. When you're in Greg Orange's position, you have this, okay, I'm winning, so I'm supposed to be winning, right? right. I need to keep going, and it's almost like a, I don't know, this this is me just projecting, but there's almost that embarrassment where you're like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. I no. was just talking in my interview about, hey, I'm undefeated. May as well <laughs> right, win the exactly. whole thing. And, but that's magic. That's when you are up against the best of the best. These types of things happen. And I want to point out this Brad Nelson run here, too, because Brad Nelson yeah, versus what? John Rolfe and Shota Yasaoka, those were not good matchups for Brad. He was like, I brought Esper Hero. You know, he was auto in the top 16 because of his results mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. spark split for the MPL, but he ran up against... Esper control, Esper control, doesn't feel good, but Brad Nelson's like, dust off the shoulders, doesn't matter, here I am in the top Oh uh, Yeah, I just want to give a call back to myself. <laughs> Day one, who did I say to look for? You Brad, said Brad Nelson, Nelson, right? Everyone has a cute pick, I don't. I'm like, who's the best guy? All business. That's my horse, Brad Nelson all in, and boy, did that gameplay deliver today. All right, so there you have it. These two players already locked for top four, Shahar Shenhar and Brad Nelson. In. Brad Nelson, of course, your MPL division winner, so he's already in the top 16. Can he make it all the way? Let's take a look at our lower bracket from earlier today. And day nine, here is where some of the best matches were today. Yeah, you know what? Let's just start off with the big story, right? Let's start with the best first. Where we're going to begin with Dessert Kai Buddha playing a tough match against BBD in the first lower round. A tough second oh, round gosh. in lowers. And then in this, this was insane. final game against Shota Yasuoka, who has literally a stronger deck, period, yes. in this position. Yes, absolutely. This matchup does not favor Kai. Because of the hand in his the card in his hand, Bullis is Citadel. And let's let's not forget, look at this. Yasuoka has five available mana. If there was just one more mana on the field, Bullis of Citadel would have landed. That 29 life could have begun turning into spells. But first things first. Command the Dread Horde and look at how carefully and deliberately Kai Buddha investigates both graveyards, pulls out Narset, Big Teferi, Little Teferi, and as if things weren't going well enough, the next spell that's lurking on the deck. I know it. Elder I know it. Spell. Elder Spell. Yeah, and what's cool too is going down to four was, you know, not exactly 100% safe territory for him either because of a few outs in Shota's mm -hmm, deck. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I just want to give a nod to how long Kai Buddha is taking in this position. <laughs> Obviously, when you play three large planeswalkers, your, your eyes get a little big. You go, oh, I did it. There's oh a lot gosh. to think about. Am I going to win? I think I did. Oh my gosh, yeah. But no, Kai slows down, starts really thinking. He knows there's a bullet of Citadel he's got to face through. And this is a very brutal Narset draw, where at this point, Shota Yasuoka does not really have any spectacular play. Just going to play this uh, little ter Teferi Time Raveler over here. And I mean, I, we're all waiting for the big moment. In a moment, since it's going in warp speed, we're going to start introducing what's happening in the future now. Kai Buddha is going to draw an Elder Spell, which lets you put two loyalty on one Planeswalker for each Planeswalker that Elder Spell destroys. And so off the top, this Elder Spell is going to target the two Planeswalkers on the enemy side and two Planeswalkers on Kai Buddha's side. And that will lead to a total of eight loyalty onto Teferi Hero of Dominaria. The minus eight emblem pops up, and then it's just a slow boa constrictor move out. Slowly strangling Shota Yasuoka, taking away his permanence one by one by one with every draw from Kai Buddha. Yeah, this this is awesome. Here you go. There's the Elder Spell in action. <laughs> Boom, there's the emblem. And oh wait, oh. Teferi's still at one. No big deal. And you saw the Replace reaction him. from Yasuoka, who's just been yes. so poised, so calm, so focused, just uh, just throwing his head back. And I mean, Kai Buddha's reaction afterwards, he's almost in disbelief. That was just such a difficult what sequence. What a series to of draws for yeah. Kai Buddha. And the thing is, his last big finish, by the way, nine years ago, 2010, Pro Tour Amsterdam. Welcome back, Buddha. Man. Class is forever. Kai Buddha with seven wins under his belt, going for eight. Why not go to double digits? Huh? Why, why not? not? Let's, why not? Let's just why get not? to 10 Mythic Championships what about 12? this year. Yes, that seems reasonable. All right, take a look once again at our lower bracket. So that, of course, only one of the matches that we had down here in our lower bracket, but a whole ton of awesome action uh, down here in our lower bracket from our players. So much exciting stuff. 
Anything else stand out to you, Day9? Well, I mean, the last big run that we haven't talked about yet is Li Shitian, who, as Cedric was noting in Day 1, pretty much any of the base white decks that were shown on Day 1, loss after loss after loss after That's loss, true. with Cedric commentating, going, this isn't supposed to happen. And then Li Shitian comes in and is narrowly winning every single match. 2-1 against Simon Gertsen, which was a weird Simic ramp deck. 2-1 against Marcio Carvalho, who had a very tricky Esper deck to play against. And then once again, John Rolf, another very tricky Esper matchup. And Li Xitian, I think he's going to have the easiest match, well, I shouldn't say easiest match yet, easiest match up yet. Matthias Leverado is obviously an excellent player, but a white deck that can get out super aggressively before a Nexus oh, of yes. Fate deck can actually get up and going. I really think that this could be an opportunity to see White weenie deck, splashing little blue, hanging out in top four. I love it. You know, it's not only Cedric who likes those aggressive decks. I'm also there too. Oh, it's, what, what is this little shoulder? Just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, winning in four decks. turns. Yes. <laughs> By the way, hey Paul, what's oh, up? Oh, wow! I, I took a really sh quick nap after all the excitement from wow. the past few games. I, I was nap. physically exhausted after after those games, but we had some really incredible matchups in the in the last couple games. Yeah, no, I mean. <laughs> Paul tanked so hard on adrenaline, his body actually collapsed after the last match. Yes, it was, I, I fell to the floor. We dragged him off without any sympathy, and we, we you know, put a little adrenaline in his heart. I've like got to ask you what it's like <laughs> to commentate on that kind of match, Paul. Uh, it's 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 really exciting, and it's honestly one of the main reasons why I do this. You know, sure you have your typical matches, but every now and then you just get an epic match for the ages, and that. Kind